Hey guys, how's it going? I hope you're all doing great and following the three H's of the channel. And in this video, it's all about strange and scary things seen on the job. So, if that sounds like something you're interested in, pull up a stump and let's jump into it. Thank you for watching. So I used to be in the US Army, and this is something that happened when I was in Korea. My unit was running a shooting range. Basically at that point, my job was guard duty, making sure that no dumbasses walk onto the live range. I was chilling by a gate on top of a small mountain. A South Korean officer asked me to follow him. I drive over to the back gate to guard that one, and I was chilling by that gate for a while. Then I realized that the South Korean guy had pretty much disappeared. I had been alone for over two hours. And then I start to notice something. I notice people walking through some trees to my left, just outside the back gate. It's just vague outlines of people through the trees. I at first figured it was local hikers. I notice but they are not making any noise though. I get out of my truck to get a closer look and I still can't hear them. They move into the road about 50 feet away. They are wearing traditional Korean clothes. I almost shit bricks when they move straight through the trees. I'm thinking, there's no way I'm seeing this, but there's still no noise. One of them then moves straight through the guardrail, clear as day. I'm frozen in place. Eventually, I get back to my vehicle, and 20 minutes later, our ranges mysteriously close down. I haven't told many people about this. I don't want to seem crazy. So I work as a janitor in my local lyceum which is the Polish version of a high school. The school is pretty huge. There's four floors, including a basement, and it used to be a military base. I like my job, but there was one thing that I always found to be really troublesome. From time to time, we would have these so-called cinema nights. Students and two or three teachers would come to school during the evening and watch movies together. It would usually end around 1 a.m. Now, since there were only two or three teachers, there was a rule that they could only stay on the ground floor in the classrooms. Roaming around the school was forbidden, but you know how kids are. Some of them always found the way to sneak out and explore the school at night. In most cases, it was either horny teenagers or pranksters. Anyways... During these nights, my main job was to patrol the hallways and find those kids who lost their way, if you know what I mean. One time, a teacher phones me and says that some girl went to the toilet and didn't come back, and when they went to check on her, she wasn't there. Another boy also disappeared from a different classroom. I sighed over the phone because we pretty much know what was going on. They were probably off making out somewheres, but I started to look for them. I wasn't really scared. I knew the school too well for that, but schools at night have a very specific atmosphere. I'm sure you know. I went to the basement first, stopping from time to time to check and see if I hear anything. Nothing. Just for a moment, I think I hear a sound at the stairs behind me, but there's nothing there. I go up the stairs, still nothing, and then I finally find them on the highest floor. And this is where it gets really weird. When I find them, the boy is holding the girl. The girl is crying and holding her leg. One of my first thoughts was that they were fooling around and then she fell and got hurt. But the boy interrupted and said no, they were trying to go back downstairs but something attacked them, and the girl had a massive bite on her leg that looked like a very large dog bite. Confused, I thought that maybe one of the kids had snuck a dog in somehow, but this wasn't possible. 
I had searched the entire school, other teachers as well, and this was on the top floor. So, I helped him downstairs. We called the doctor. Everyone is shocked. No one knows anything about being attacked or any kind of dog or whatever it was. We asked the kids for their account of exactly what happened. The short version is that they were a couple and they wanted to meet on the highest floor. The girl was there first. She heard running. The boy opens the door to the toilet. She steps out into the dark hallway to give him a hug and a kiss. And then suddenly, they hear something running toward them. It bowls over her boyfriend and then attacks her and bites her leg. And she only referred to it as a dog because of the growling that she heard from the dark hallway. But she never actually saw the thing. We searched the entire school but found nothing. I still have no idea what it was or if it was a dog, how it managed to sneak in and then get away. All of the windows were shut. All of the doors were locked most of the time. We also have monitoring on all entrances, but it registered nothing. The more I think about it, the more I don't think that it was a dog. I don't know what it was. So before I start, there's no real punchline to this. I never did actually figure out what was going on. Several years ago, I went down to Guatemala. It's not important why. The only thing that you need to know is that me and a few others were going to be meeting one-on-one -on -one with a bunch of locals over about two weeks. For our whole area, there was myself and a colleague, although she's not really important to anything that's about to happen. I discover early on that many of the women that we talk to are scared to go to the hospital. I'm just trying to figure out why, but the locals won't say. I make a note of it, and I move on. We're on a tight schedule. I don't forget about it, though. Going forward, I make a point of gauging how everyone feels about the hospital. It's clear that they're uncomfortable talking about it. This is ringing alarm bells in my head because it's very pertinent as to why I'm there in the first place. Anyway, there's a local doctor that I'm in close contact with, Dr. Gomez. He works at the hospital in question. On the second day of my arrival, I meet up with him. I tell him what I'm hearing so far. Now most of you will think these are ignorant peasants, they're probably just scared of modern medicine. But take it from someone who works closely with Central American rural farmers and villagers all the time. That's just a cliche. Many are deeply superstitious, of course, but they're not scared of any modern medicine. They just think that the modern treatments are often less effective than their herbal remedies. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is, Dr. Gomez actually tries to sell me on this ignorant peasant BS. Not in those words, though. This sets off more alarm bells. It's a very strange thing for a doctor to say about his own community. I become suspicious, not just of the hospital, but of Dr. Gomez as well. I keep this to myself, though. The next day, I am meeting with locals again. For your information, my colleague and I are moving down a list of families that we have to meet with. We're about a quarter of the way down this list by the third day. The first few people that we meet express the same wariness about the hospital that the others did. Again, they won't really say why. About halfway through the day, everything changes. Anytime I bring up the hospital, people sing its praises. It's like that for the entire rest of the day. I'm puzzled. What do I make of this turn of events? I decide to follow a hunch. The next day, I backtrack. My colleague continues moving down the list, meeting with locals, while I revisit a few families that we've already talked to. Suddenly, all those people are changing their tune. I mention that they expressed concerns about the hospital before. They deny it. 
I become more direct, reading from my notes. They still deny it. And then it hits me. They're all parroting the same thing. It's like someone's been coaching them. To explain this next part, I will have to tell you a little bit more about why I was there. So I was sent down to Guatemala because there's an obesity and diabetes epidemic down there. The local government was working jointly with doctors and scientists to develop a nutritional guideline, but nobody follows it. The government is perplexed. I was brought in to have a roundtable discussion with the local scientific community to work on resolving what they regarded as a cultural issue. Dr. Gomez was one of the participants in this discussion. All participants were provided with the list that myself and my colleague would use in conducting our interviews with the locals. So Dr. Gomez had this list. I thought about his suspicious hand-waving and the fact that roughly after I'd spoken with him, everyone began changing their story. I realize that I'm about to be totally stonewalled if I don't do something. So I decide to go off script. I jump to the end of the list. I visit a family living on the outer edges of the village. When I get there, I see Dr. Gomez leaving. He doesn't even notice me because he's holding the damn list, reading through it. But he looks up and his reaction confirms my suspicions. Surprise, concern, anger. But he plays it off quickly. He tells me that he's surprised to see me out here already. I ask him what he's doing out here. He said he was making a house call. I ask, about what? He said, physician-patient privilege, and then very curtly tells me that he has to go. I decide to go ahead and talk with the family. I find the wife alone. Of course, she doesn't tell me anything, but she's obviously scared, terrified. But when I bring it up, she says that she just doesn't feel well. So I ask her if she wants me to take her to the hospital. And then I see panic in her eyes. She tells me, no, no, no. It's just a headache or something. Keep in mind that she's acting like this after pretty much parroting what all the others said, singing the hospital's praises. Something is going on here and it's getting buried. I can feel it. That night, I'm in my room. I'm staying in a small house with my colleague. I'm thinking through my interviews and looking through my notes. It's very late and I should be in bed. When I hear footsteps outside my window, I glance outside, but nobody's there. By this point, my suspicions have kind of got my anxiety heightened. I'm a researcher after all, and part of my training involves knowing when you're stepping on people's toes. I could sense that when I ran into Dr. Gomez earlier today. I'm wondering if maybe there's something bigger here than I realize. Then I hear movement at the front door. I get up and slowly make my way over to it. Through the gap at the bottom, I see someone's shadow, and then it walks away. The footsteps recede. Soon, it's silent. I don't open the door right away, but when I feel that it's safe, I check outside. A strange item is laying on the ground. I'm not sure what I'm looking at at first. It looks like a homemade doll, but it's not. It's actually a handful of sticks, all sharpened to a point. Each of them are about six inches long, tied together with a piece of twine. I'm about to pick it up when I realize that a couple of the sticks are actually bones. I don't know much about anatomy, but it looked like maybe a forearm bone, like an ulna that had been snapped in two pieces and bound up with the rest of the sticks. This is weird, and the bundle also has writing all over it. I look closer. They're not words, but ideograms or hieroglyphs. Some of the characters even resemble Chinese. I'm describing all of this just to give you an image, but the important thing is what was underneath. It's hard to tell in the dark, but I'm pretty sure 
it was in a pool of blood. I heard movement again. I looked around. I couldn't see much of anything. I decided to leave the thing there and go back inside. I figured that I would tell my colleague before we leave the house the next morning so she doesn't freak out. I do this, but when I go to show her the item, it's gone. My colleague thinks I'm playing a trick on her. I insist that I saw what I just described to you. She has a hard time believing me, which is understandable. There isn't even a stain where I said I saw blood. In the end, she just shrugs and says that we should forget about it. So fast forward, the two weeks are over. We're preparing to leave. In the end, I never discovered why the locals were frightened of the hospital. Since they'd changed their tune, I couldn't even mention it in my policy recommendation, so I wrote some sort of report on cultural competency, urging the scientific community to engage with the locals one-on-one -on -one in the hopes that something would come to light. I never heard anything more on the matter. But now, a few months later, I talked to that colleague. I brought up the weird item. She said that she had been meaning to tell me something. She said it happened that day that I told her about the item. Afterwards, we'd resumed our work, visiting dozens of locals. She was especially eager to finish up our final report. But during that time, in a few different houses, she noticed items exactly like the one that I described to her. Some were pretty different, but some were almost identical. She saw clumps of dirt and moss tied together, sticks tied together with twine, sharpened to a point. Some had writing, some didn't. When these objects did have writing, she noticed that it looked like Chinese, or almost hieroglyphs, exactly like I had described to her. Of course, she was struck by this, but she was pretty consumed with the wrap-up process since we were nearing the end of our stay. Plus, it just didn't seem relevant to our report. Still, she jotted down notes about these items, just in case. Later, after we left, she looked over her notes and made a weird discovery. These items were all concentrated within a specific area. Every single household that was sitting more or less in the perimeter of the hospital a big circle all the way around. She believed this was maybe a coincidence. I still, honestly, have no idea what to think. So I work at a hotel, and I started this job several years ago. When I started it, I was very much struggling to get by. I was 24 years old. I ended up getting the job through a friend the hotel is completely huge and even has a conference center in it, but basically my job was just to make sure that all the rooms are in order and clean up after the guests leave, as well as set up the conference rooms for whenever they have been booked. Generally, at first, the job was very chill. I was just walking around, listening to music while I worked. However, after the first couple of shifts, some of the other aspects of the workplace started to make themselves known. It started out small, like hearing someone faintly talk to me, me turning around and pulling out my earbuds to hear what they were saying, only to be met with an empty room or hallway. I know that may not seem scary to the majority of you, but keep in mind for me, this was my first ever experience, and it wasn't the last by any means. I'll be telling you a few stories. So, story number one. The pretext is that I got a call from my boss. He asked if I could come in a bit earlier than usual due to one of my co-workers quitting and refusing to ever step foot here again, so he wasn't going to honor the two weeks. So I say, sure thing, Mr. Boss, sir. I said like an idiot who needed this job desperately. So when I arrived... I asked the receptionist, who was a super cute girl, why the co-worker quit. She said they didn't say, 
but they were very agitated when they laughed. I said, like, angry, agitated? And she said no, more like scared, really scared. This was kind of worrying, but not really my problem. Basically, I have to go up and start where he left off, and that's where their story really begins. It was a single bedroom on the first floor. For some reason, the door was really weird when I tried to enter. It just kind of kept locking itself when I unlocked it, and no, we don't have auto locks on these doors. When I managed to outsmart the door, I guess is the best word for it, I was hit with a wave of thick air from the room. The air wasn't humid or hot or anything like that, but it kind of felt like I was inhaling jello, if that makes any sense at all. I opened the window and I assessed the room. It didn't seem to be too bad. It was just some towels on the floor and an untiny bed. After fixing up the room, I went to check the bathroom. I had my back turned for maybe five seconds when I turned back toward the bed. It had been screwed with. I blamed the open window and tidied it up once more after closing it. I was on my way out of the room when it felt like that the towels got snagged on something. Suddenly, this snag turned into a full-on pull, and I watched the damn things slide across the floor toward the once more untidy bed. My heart started pounding, and I was frozen in place for a couple of seconds, and then the door slammed shut, and I thought, oh, hell no. Once more, I had to fight the lock in order to open the door. All the while, the air seemed to be getting thicker and thicker, and it was becoming hard to breathe. After a couple of tries, the door finally relented, and I stumbled out of the room in a panic. My boss was there, staring at me like I was a lunatic. He had come my way to ask me if I could cover some more shifts that month. I tried to explain what had happened, but in between my panic state and being out of breath, it probably sounded something like an asthmatic kid failing at a spelling bee. My boss is chill, so he humors me and approaches the door. It opens on the first try, and he inspects the room. I look like a total idiot at this point. He turns to look at me through the doorway, saying, Come on, man, you didn't even and then it gets cut off. The door has slammed shut again, and then panicked door handle rattling ensues. When he eventually got it open, he stumbled out in the same fashion that I just had. We are both silent for a minute or so. He is visibly pale and sweating bullets. He says, yeah, uh, just skip that room. I'll have someone check out the ventilation. And I said, the ventilation and he said yeah there's obviously a draft and the air is very stale in there his statement made no sense but i wasn't going to argue with him the room was later turned into some kind of storage area because we couldn't get the air problem fixed funnily enough we never actually used it for storage so it's just empty but yeah screw that room Another story. Every year around Easter, it's a tradition in my country, not America, and that's about as specific as I'm willing to get, but it's a tradition for companies to throw a sort of party or a feast for their employees. And no, it's not a pizza party. It's both expected and encouraged to get absolutely wankered on beer and schnapps during these parties, which makes the hotel a perfect place to have these events, since we can all just spend the night there instead of risking the trip home. Now at this point, it was well into my second year at the hotel. The receptionist and I had been flirting a lot lately, so I was heavily expecting to hook up with her the night of the party. So before I showed up, I made sure that I smelled good and looked groomed, you know, like a gentleman. That night started out great, good food and plenty of drink. I sat next to the receptionist and tried my best to put my moves on her. 
I'm super awkward, but she didn't seem to mind. As the night progressed, we both got more and more wasted. The flirting escalated to kissing and eventually copping a feel. At the end of the night, she told me to go to my room and await her arrival, and I thought, oh my god, yes, this is going to be great. As soon as I got into my room, I essentially phased out of my clothes and got under the covers, brimming with expectation. About half a second went by before my ADHD kicked in, and I decided to pull a prank by turning off all the lights so I could pretend to be asleep whenever she came in. It seemed funny to my drunk brain anyways. I laid there with my back to the door, with my eyes closed when I heard footsteps approaching. I didn't hear the door open, but it didn't strike me as weird for some reason. And then I heard this almost giggling, which made me start to giggle too, but I contained my childish excitement. I felt the covers move and someone lay down next to me and then I said, ha ha, gotcha. And as I turn, I place my hand on what I presume to be her waist. My hand lands on a cold, damp surface that feels like thick leather. I think, what the hell? I turn on the light to see nothing. The bed is empty. The presence is gone as well. This scared the hell out of me, and immediately... I was not in the mood to do anything that we were presumably going to do. It seems that my sex drive left behind a ghost of its own due to its traumatic and untimely passing. As I'm sitting there, utterly spooked, the door creaks open, and this time it's the receptionist. I had forgotten to tell her my room number, so she had gone down and looked through the bookings to find me. She can tell that I'm just freaking out all over the place, and asks what's wrong. For some reason, I actually tell her. She must have really been into me, because she doesn't call me crazy, and instead, she offers to take me to her room instead. I accept the offer, but I'm still too rattled to really do what we had planned. We pretty much just end up cuddling and making out. And I have one last one for you. A third one. Hotels are creepy at night on a good day. So a lot of my shifts carry over into the night shifts so that vacant rooms are ready for the next day. There was a particular shift where the hotel was completely empty except for me. This is highly unusual and only happened three or four times in the whole time that I worked at that hotel. The hotel takes on a whole other level of creepiness when it's like this due to one simple factor. When you know that there are guests and you know that there are at least some of the rooms that are occupied, it makes sense to hear chattering and movement when you walk through the place. But when you hear chattering and movement around the place while you know for a fact that there are no guests, this really screws with you. It really makes you wonder how many of those sounds that you normally hear are actually real people? This particular night, the hotel felt more like an entity than a building. I caught myself tiptoeing multiple times, like as if I felt that I were trespassing. I was about two-thirds of the way through the list of rooms when I started noticing something akin to a shadow man stalking me in the hallways. It would always be in my periphery, in the far end of the hallway, and would quickly disappear around a corner whenever I tried to sneak a peek at it. That thing made it extra nerve-wracking to enter and exit the rooms, since it would basically only give it a chance to move in closer, or maybe wait for me on the other side of the door while I did my job. After enduring it for about half an hour, I decided to be a pussy, and called my girlfriend. Yes, the receptionist. We're still together. And no, I don't know how I pulled it off. I explained the situation to her, and, like a loving girlfriend, offered to come keep me company. And I thought, hmm, nah, that's okay. I told her that I was feeling better just talking to her. 
We talked for a little while, until she mentioned how pretty the moon was that night. And I said, oh cool, really? She said, yeah, it's full, and it's almost like orange. I said, oh it's a blood moon, I gotta see this. So I went over to that room's window and pulled down the curtain. To my surprise, it was completely black outside. I couldn't see anything. And then I said, um, not to be a dick, but are you sure? I don't see anything. She said, that's weird. It's lighting up everything outside. Are you sure that your window is facing the right way? I say, it should be. I pulled the handle and tried to open the window so I could poke my head out and get a better look at the sky, but I was met with resistance. What the hell, I muttered as I tried pushing it a little harder. It wouldn't budge. And then suddenly, a bit of light shone in the top left corner. I thought, what the hell is that? And then suddenly, in one swift motion, the darkness just sweeps away from the outside of the window, and I am met with a bright night with a full orange moon. The best way I can describe it is as if something huge had been standing on the other side of the window and then moved away after I tried opening it, and I was on the second floor. I go quiet for about 30 seconds, and then my girlfriend says, Are you okay? Did something happen? And then I said, Uh, I'll be out of here in no time. I love you. Bye. I finished the rest of the rooms in record time, although very messily and not up to code, I got chewed out because of it the next day. I then hauled ass out of there, and I never told my girlfriend what had happened. I have some more stories, but I think for now, I'll leave you with those three. So, those were pretty crazy, weren't they? If you had a favorite one, let me know which one it was down in the comments. If you have one of your own, or would like to donate to the channel, I have links in the description that you can do that with, and super thanks here on YouTube. And I could be way off base, but in my opinion, that one from Guatemala, those things that they found, are what I would call anyways, a witch's totem. A lot of times they can be used to bring bad luck or simply be a threat. If I had to hazard a guess, I would say that it's a threat because the locals know something about trafficking, and they don't want that out. But yeah, that's just a little schizo theory for you, and I'm probably way off base. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then make sure to like and subscribe. And thank you for pulling up a stump, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching, and have a good week.